with no further ado, I would love to come to our next speaker. It's <laughs> Nicole Bertner. She's a tech optimist. She's an AI entrepreneur, investor, board member, founder and CEO of Memorantix Momentum, an IT company uh, specializing in, a in AI. She's also serving on the board of Memorantix uh, AG. Um, the company has been named the Tom top 10 AI companies. She herself is the world from the World Economic Forum, named the Digital Leader of Europe, has been named twice, 40 under 40. And with no further ado, over to you, uh, Nicole. Thanks for being here, being with <laughs> us. <laughs> Hi, Marcus. Thanks for the very warm introduction. And uh, I know it's a high pressure environment. I know Fabian well and his opinionated, passionate speeches. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it as spicy and entertaining. Um, and I hope that it is uh, so at this time you're still sort of bearing um, with me and uh, well and awake. So Wait, I wanted wait, wait, to wait one thing, uh, one thing, sorry. one thing, what we always, what we always want to ask, what fascinates you about AI? What about is AI, so, that, yes. <laughs> so I'm an economist by training and basically I am just fascinated by the impact it has. I'm not a coder, I don't find the code beautiful or any of the technical stuff. For me, it only matters what it can do in the real world and I'm really fascinated about application fields in healthcare, in education, in sustainability, in energy, um, that's what, what drives me. That's, that's great. And we are all entrepreneurs. So a lot of us are business people. And that's why we would love to hear why large language models are changing the world. Over to you and enjoy. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, I mean, what I'm saying now, as you can imagine, the news flow is crazy. So what I'm saying now is really a snapshot of today and tomorrow everything might be different. And I think that's one of the key messages I want to be sending today. And I'll, I'll, I'll make this point again and again. It's fast and it's, it's, and it, and it's happening now. And so it's, it's great that you're doing this, um, this AI conference today. Um, of course, um, Bill Gates is kind of unimpressed by uh, by a lot of technology advancements, but he is he saw two things that struck him as revolutionary, right, um, in his lifetime. So coming from Bill Gates, I would say that's a pretty interesting statement. And the first was uh, like introduced in, being introduced to graphical user interface, which is the basis for Windows, and the second is basically um, OpenAI and GPT three, just to give you an idea of even in the tech world, how, how big or how revolutionary a thing this is. And, and um, I'm, I'm going to try to give a little bit of context. So basically, he gave OpenAI the challenge to train artificial intelligence, uh, to train an AI to pass the, 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 the biology um, exam. And, um, and he thought it was going to take years, and it actually finished it in a few months. And also, also on top of that, the um, model was able to answer questions that it was not explicitly trained for. So um, it could basically, he could, he could even receive an answer, a thoughtful answer to the question, what do you say to a father with a sick child? Which is pretty, pretty interesting. And so I would, I would say, um, you know, uh, yep. um, it's, it's very much revolutionary as revolutionary as the mobile phone and the internet, but I guess you know that that's why you're here. What are large language models? I'm gonna give you a very, I'm not a coder, so this is going to be very non-technical. Um, um, uh, excuse all the technical uh, people here, um, uh, but I guess for the benefit of the wider audience. So what is um, a general, so what is a large language model? It's a general purpose NLP model based on deep learning. And basically what it means, it's trained on billions of parameters. So very, very large amounts of data. You can just scrape the internet and trained it on trillions of words. And you can also imagine the text body is trained on is pretty representative of what's going on on the internet. It's a lot of English language, you know, some Chinese, some other languages, but largely English language models. Um, what I've, I've listed here are just um, is also to show you that this is not something that only OpenAI is doing, right? So just to also give you an idea, there are large language models. They have been around also for a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a time. And... Um, Bloom is one of them, ChatGPT is obviously one of them. Google AI is also has one of them, right? Because there was a lot of news flow on, oh, will Google lose out because they didn't do this? They also have these models and the two at the bottom are actually the open source 
uh, variant. So there is, I would say, a broader movement to this, just um, to give you maybe this insight. Um, but obviously, ChatGPT hit it big in the media and also um, pushing it hard commercially. Um, they're pretty becoming a platform um, technology, and they have like real-world impact already now, right? So um, we're seeing, for example, here at the bottom, these are companies being formed using OpenAI, right? Um, using OpenAI's technology. And, and I mean, that's pretty already a pretty huge amount of uh, companies that are being formed just on top of this technology. Um, you can see, for example, um, for us in the industry, it would be something like, yeah, the, the, the typical coding interview is also something that you don't, you know, that you could say, um, uh, ChatGPT put a nail in the, in the on the coffin for this for coding interviews because you can you know immediately prompt ChatGPT to get to get smart answers. Um, you can see GPT takes the bar exam. So interesting how experts are feeling threatened, and you can see this ultimately in the in the reaction also by policymakers. Right, New York City blocks ChatGPT at schools. You heard news flow out of Italy banning the development and work on these side of models. Um, if you want my three cents on this very briefly, it's basically, I don't believe that you can put a lid on this. Um, and my personal take would be that if entrepreneurs who actually train these models themselves, say they're afraid of them and they think there should be a moratorium, we should ask ourselves the question, what is their commercial interest in putting a moratorium on everybody else developing the solution while you have um, shares in a solution that basically um, already exists? That would be in my two cents. And I think something like Italy, I mean, it makes it makes no sense to kind of ban the evolution of this. Um, this is coming and the question is how can we shape it? And I think that's also always a question we have as entrepreneurs. How can we actually use this and shape it and make something impactful and and and, and sustainable out of this? Mm, maybe another fact, um, I know this is coming, this is taking everybody by surprise, I want to say this um, chat GPT and it's revolutionizing everything. I've listed here basically some of the, the timeline and, and affiliations of these large language models, just to give you an idea of like in the technical community, we've, we've been looking at this for some time now, right? 2019, we've seen, you know, the, the first of these models. And, and, and so we I want to say we we're not surprised by this, <laughs> um, but obviously ChatGPT. What changed this is the user interface to make it accessible to the larger public that everybody's everybody and everybody's grandmother can now use it, and this has created this outrage or surprise in public, and we're like a little bit surprised about the surprise, <laughs> if you will, because you can kind of see the data adding up and, and, and leading to this um, when you look at the papers and, and kind of what's going on um, in the community. And, and I just wanted to, I don't want to be too technical with that, but I'm just trying to show you some charts and some data, take this home that you, that you can basically see model sizes keep on increasing. So this means the amount of data used um, to train these models keeps on increasing. This is what you see on this diagonal path. So, the first GPT compared to sort of the last, last models, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge increase in, in the amount um, of parameters and actually GPT-4, which has just been released, we don't even know. OpenAI did no longer release how big this model is. So we, we, don't, we don't actually know, but we, we can only suspect it's somewhere on this, on this line. That's what this diagonal line is showing us. So they're becoming bigger and bigger also as data amounts are increasing. And you can see a second trend, which is basically a circa 18 month delay for repeat implementation. So you see a first paper, paper here, and then you see basically other people looking at how can we repeat this result and how can we, how can we keep on doing this? So I think also in terms of, will there be monopolies or is there a chance to diversify? Also, this is also supposed to give you a picture of, okay, there are other people working on this and there are other people working working on repeat implementations of this. Um, also, I mean, this is maybe a little bit more technical, but I want to say the, the important thing here is this accuracy thing. So um, I think when you use ChatGPT, most of the people are already pretty impressed by what it can do. But what we kind of see is that the accuracy, right, is is maybe not, it's not 100% yet. Um, but what we can clearly see, and you can 
and just linearly kind of project this, this line um, with the number of parameters, um, you will, we will be reaching, you know, a hundred and a hundred would be, you know, um, would be, would be accurate. And, and then you can kind of project it to kind of superhuman <laughs> behavior, right? Um, sometime in the, in the future, um, when you, when you continue this pathway. And, and I think that's, that's quite an interesting, interesting, uh, graphic to look at. And, and, you know, the question is how much time will this take? But we we're very convinced this will happen. Um, maybe a little bit towards the strategic assets. I mean, as an entrepreneur, I keep on thinking about okay, what are now the strategic things we need to build up? We need to invest as a country, as a company, to kind of uh, leverage these large large models. What are the ingredients that go into it? Um, one very important one, as I as I already mentioned, is sort of the just the amount of parameters and the data that goes into it. So if you will, large language models are comparatively easy in terms of data accessibility. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, you know, you have to scrape all this data, but it's, um, it's publicly available data. Um, so you can ask yourself in your industry, where do you have large amounts of data? Um, where is there this large amount of data? And this can be become a really strategic asset in training these large models, potentially other domains, right? Not not necessarily replicating what the what what ChatGPT is doing, but replic but, but building new foundation models based on the same technology. But for example, on supply chain data, on creditworthiness data, on drug discovery data, and so on. The second ingredient is sort of infrastructure. So um, data and data assets are critical. The second one is infrastructure, and we see this reflected in a lot of political action chips. Sort of the, the the Chips Act and um, Chips and AI being declared critical infrastructure, I would say, is very telling and very revealing. And I mean, in Germany, speaking for Germany, um, as I'm based in Berlin, um, yeah, we're, we're talking about basically roads, right? So we need to understand that building large, um, high performance compute clusters is actually a strategic asset and a strategic um, a, a geopolitic asset probably also, but certainly for economic and for business competitiveness, an asset. And how can we actually ensure access to this asset? I think as a, certainly as an economy and also for certain businesses who are thinking about moving into the space need to, need to really be aware of. Mm. The third is talent. You won't be surprised by this, um, but building the state of the art, may I multiply really a large amount of skills and the European market is, is significantly lagging behind the US and China on this. And we need we need to kind of break this thought pattern of, okay, we, we, we have IT people. This is just another IT application. There are very specific skills that go into it and we kind of need to hone them. And again, if you're trying to think about these, the, the, these kind of applications, that's, in my opinion, another critical asset you should be, you th should be looking at. Um, the, the fourth is kind of benchmarks. How do we actually um, how do we actually look at what the impact is we're creating? Um, and there, the benchmarks are important. For example, we're very U.S. Um, English centric. Um, let's think about Europe. Let's think about German region um, or, or other European regions. Right there, you there are other languages that are relevant, um, and and that also becomes very important in this game. Um, I just put this here just kind of to, to give you an idea, even we who are completely focused on this technology, right? Or going on Twitter, reading papers and so on every day. And we have a whole team basically interested in soaking this up. And, and this is just another week in, in AI, right? So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, bam, 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 bam. So it's, it's kind of going very fast and the list is not even complete. Um, and you kind of see, you know, um, you see kind of some large language models being leaked. You see Google USM and then the subsequent subsequent week, you see sort of an AI moratorium. Um, you see open AI privacy box. You see kind of sparks of, of, of um, artificial general um, intelligence paper. So it's, it's a very fast moving environment. And, um, and so I think for you also as entrepreneurs, it's critical to think about, okay, what are some strategic topics I need to keep in mind to really leverage this? Um, 
yeah, the list of impactful results is, is, is really also very long to, to keep track of. Um, they're, they're really, these models are arriving in productization very fast right now. Um, and there is the first wave for us is this language, the language section. So we're already seeing, you know, companies looking at content production, looking at customer interaction, um, customer care, customer success interaction with this. We're seeing law firms um, using this, et cetera. The second wave of foundation models we very clearly see is kind of coming up as computer vision, and speech recognition. So building a model like this for reference, you know, in the past world, you had to have people annotating an image physically, kind of understand to segment pixel by pixel of the image, tell you what is a window or a, a, an important use case for this autonomous driving, for example. Um, where's the where's a grandma, where's a bike, where's like a trottoir, et cetera. Now, this is just generated by a foundational model. So a lot of companies who actually built this technology bespoke are just kind of wiped out because you can just use, use, use this technology and it's even producing sometimes much better results. Um, and, and large language models are also turn, turning into complex applications. So one example is, for example, here, I don't know, I mean, I may be revealing my age a little bit, but it's actually an application that's so a bit of the art right now. Is um, is SimCity? You probably you um, probably still see this. So what what you're basically doing here is you have a SimCity world, and you're using a large language model that basically uses the model to understand what human behavior is, and that suggests to the agent here, the, to the player, what to do, what the different characters are doing. Right? Sim is like you have these characters and they go to sleep and then they build things and you know they do di different activities and you you can basically use a large language model to play this and they're they're without knowing the rules of the game or anything like this this they're basically showing human like behavior so what we're seeing is they're really good at learning context and understanding okay what is a human doing and now now you can think of um, and I, I put this on on on, on the right. Um, this is basically Meta's version, I would say, on a larger geo geopolitical scale. This is a, a foundation model fed um, diplomacy game. So I don't know if any of you played the Risk or Diplomacy when you're when you're when you're a little, or maybe even still. And even these strategic board games um, where players negotiate and maneuver to gain control of countries, you can kind of have. When players rely on diplomacy, they basically um, can 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 achieve really victories, and that's that's interesting because that's also skill. And you can think of applications in the business world: negotiation games, country expansion plans. So you can think of, I would say, many business critical applications that become that come into reach when you think about an application layer of where is it relevant to simulate human behavior, for example. Finally, maybe we'll be able to do some um, data and simulation-based economic policies, right? What if we use this technology to try to model a pandemic, for example? What if we use this to try to model consumer behavior in certain sectors, um, flows in cities, et cetera? So the application fields are, are quite interesting and, and depending on which industry you're in, um, um, quite, quite, yeah, quite impactful. Um, and you, you can think about like there are many more um, many more features that are being worked on right now. So a lot of the criticism that was um, that was sort of uttered with GPT three oh it's not correcting it's not um, producing the correct output um, it has bias um, it can't um, it can't use for example yet the it didn't have access to for example the Ukraine war because. It didn't have access to external knowledge. It had a cutoff in the data that was fed into the model that was prior to the to the Ukraine war, for example. Um, so that's being worked on. I'm not I'm not saying it's being a hundred percent resolved, and some of those risks stay there. But you have to imagine it's so the evolution is so fast that those things, you know, already in GPT four are drastically reduced, and you can just project the speed of um, of evolution and. And here, I just brought an example of a, of a law firm because we're interacting at the moment also with some law firms. You know, if you think of the combination of OpenAI and ChatGPT and GPT-4, and then think, okay, GPT can actually take the bar exam, 
and pass it. And you, um, you are a law firm. I took Simmons and Simmons, no, uh, no advertising intended. You're a law firm and you have some bespoke data sets on this. Then this is the combination you need to, you need to be thinking of. So every one of you as a business, um, if you have data that's, that's not public in, on the internet, right? Because it's, and, and we see this, for example, in deep industry applications, supply chain data, production data, you know, bespoke IP, all these kind of things, those can now become potentially interesting um, combinations, right? With the skills of a chat GPT to create very interesting solutions, you know? Can you think about drafting, classifying contracts and, you know, legal proceedings even better. So GPT off the cuff can probably already do something, but if you combine it now with bespoke curated content and the knowledge of experts and some data that you have potentially accumulated over some years, this will become, this is what we see is like the next application of, of interesting and business relevant applications. So, you know, maybe to sum it up a little bit, we have like the, the past 10 years and I created insights through pattern recognition, right? We have basically, um, you know, finding um, finding um, patterns, finding sort of some of the things, and 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 this was basically um, um, one percent of the market, right, of the value chain. Just finding patterns, finding mistakes, finding all these kind of things. And ChatGPT and GPT three, four, or five. Now we're is kind of opening the door to AI, starting to think, combine create, which is actually the vast and untapped majority of any value chain. So now we are looking at a much larger market size and we're looking at these kind of 99% which was untapped previously and which is now within reach. And I think that's what you need to keep keep in mind. I'm, I have like one or two minutes um, left. So I just wanted to leave you with, with, you know, a few things, a few trends that we see coming up. AI for decision-making as I as I um, outlined, you know, the Cicero diplomacy kind of modeling behavior and being able to drive decision making is one thing I think you should watch out for in the next year and also think think of um, in the coming in the coming year as a, as a business yourself. Um, there will be sort of open source and platformization of this AI technology. So the monopoly of GPT is ending. There will be more open source sol solutions and there will also be a commoditization of large models. Um, so the stronger focus will be on defensibility and that comes back to unique data. And that's potentially something that's kind of behind the wall, um, of a company, of a private, of a private company. And that's potentially also interesting for you as entrepreneurs. Interaction-based design is hugely important. So, um, the current AI models generate output based on instruction, and this requires new model design and these smart interfaces will make it more easy also to at to implement these solutions in your company and make it easier for also, you know, um, your employees or teams to actually accept these solutions and um, very key for productivity. And I would say um, we need to think about also sovereignty in some aspects um, because, yeah, it's an important curation layer and it's a strategic asset and, and, and quite impactful. So thinking about the strategic assets that we need to assemble it, assemble the technologies are quite important. I'm gonna jump to this. I think I'm, um, this is an example of lag in AI innovation versus um, investing early, Sears versus Walmart, for example. And um, I think one of the take home messages is AI will not replace you, but the person using AI might replace you. So yeah, with that, um, I'm at the end and that's kind of a fast run through right. of what we're seeing. All right, all right. Actually, thank you so much, Nicole. You are definitely superhuman and I don't know whether I can actually make the bar test, um, but I have a question for you. So I follow Benedict Evans on Twitter. Um, he's actually a venture partner at Entrepreneur First, Mosaic Ventures, and was at AZ16. And he, on the 9th of April on Twitter, said, large language models do not answer questions. 
they create things that look like answers to questions that look like your question. These systems clearly do not have the kind of structural understanding that we have today, and we don't know if we are on the short path for them to get that or not. What's your stake on this? Are we just fooled by this entire thing? Does it look too good? Yeah, we will too. What do you think? Um, so, I mean, you, you can argue that, you know, um, maybe the context that uh, these models are forming is not yet perfect. I'm getting some background noise, sorry. Um, yeah. And if I can't hear my own voice, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Um, so I think some of the, some of the, um, I think you can argue that the contextualization is not yet perfect, but it's pretty darn impressive. I mean, when you think that you're outperforming, you know, in many instances, students, um, lawyers and humans in contextualizing, then you can, I mean, you could take a radical constructivistic view and say, yeah, maybe humans are also having these hallucinations and, you know, but, but I would say, you know, it, it does the trick. So in the end, yeah. that's what kind of, if it creates impact and value in the world, you know, does it I matter? Completely sh I completely share this. I, I, I was just very thrilled because he always posts like this edgy questions or statements <laughs> on, on LinkedIn. That's very nice. But another thing maybe, in, in MyTech where I work, we see that we have this MyTech log, which basically says that technology changes exponentially, but organizations change linearly which basically means all these wonderful things that we were talking about in terms of what's possible. How do we, we as entrepreneurs make sure that organizations, they follow this trend, they are actually agile enough to get you know, on track for this AI revolution? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think you need to, I think it takes like a few things. I think from the leadership, you need to understand some of these trends and also understand your own limitations about these trends and still come up with the courage to invest and do something on the topic, right? And react to it because, you know, I'm the CEO of an AI company and I also rely on other people to be smart enough to get the nitty gritty on this, but we still have to make important investment decisions in terms of infrastructure, et cetera. So I think um, as a leader, you need to have the courage. Um, I think um, a second thing that people are actually worried about is values and, um, and um, yeah, the human factor, I mean, it's just kind of a huge thing. So you, I think you need to be credible in your organization to have the trust of your organization that you are doing this truly, you know, to empower people and to, get, to increase the, the, the company's um, reach. And then, then you need also methodology to, to, to um, increase results. So be business driven, look at business impact, um, align it with other strategic goals. I mean, you have to give it a purpose, you know, is, is your overall company strategy on top line revenue? Is it sustainability? Is it risk mitigation? You have to align it with some other strategic goals. So people kind of not just like, okay, we're doing something tech. So we do something tech. Um, I think that's, that's, that's really crucial as well. Um, so maybe, and maybe a final question on that. Would you, if you implement innovation in a company, would you, would you, implement it directly in the company or would you start a new entity which basically does that? Because I come to the startup scene and when companies were sold to larger enterprises, they actually liked the separate entity because they didn't have to worry about change management. How do you see that? Honestly, I think, um, I think that won't work because if you think of it, if of AI and ChatGPT like the internet, then basically, then you would have to create a new company in every single company there is out there. I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think that's the fastest way forward. So we need to embrace this. In some cases, this might be true, but um, I think it's not a scalable solution that will work for the whole industry or like for, for overall, all companies now. Yes, wonderful. So maybe we ask everyone for a last final sentence for us to take away. What would it be? What comes to your mind? Um, as I said, you need to make clear in your organizations, this technology is not coming to replace you as people. The, the, the technology is not going to replace you, but other people who understand and embrace and use this technology, they will displace you and your business. 
nothing left to say. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining, contributing. We loved your talk. And again, we will, you know, everybody can connect you on LinkedIn. Uh, you are uh, out there. Please do so. There, I could talk with you for hours, but unfortunately moved over to the next topic. So thanks again, Nicole. Thanks. Uh, all the best and uh, see you soon.